Hey everyone, I hope you can all hear me. Wow, there's a lot of people here already. Hi all. <laughs> I'm um I'm getting used to these impromptu streams based on crap that the government have done. Let's actually leave that but leave that on. What an absolute <laughs> It's amazing what is going on at the moment. It's absolutely amazing. And you can tell just how just a, a little bit of a, an observation. Uh, Paul Mason, uh, who is, I think, editor of the Daily Mirror, Daily Mirror Pod Politics, said, um, you can tell how bad this is by just how very stoic and very assured and very calming the BBC are being. <laughs> so you can see, really, in the background, they are running around with their heads on fire. As, as Paul, Ma Paul, I think Paul Mason said, I haven't got the tweet, but Paul Mason said, you know, Jamie Corbyn loses... Jamie Corbyn loses a, a toggle on his duffel coat and all of a sudden it's it's a disaster. <laughs> and this is, yeah, it's just another day at the office for the BBC, this is. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Luke, Dishwasher, Luke Dishwasher says, Jamie Corbyn's Labour Party for government, just saying. It's getting closer by the day. Mate, it's getting closer by the day because this is just, it's stretched past breaking point long ago. It really has. It's, um, I don't think we're that far off a Jamie Corbyn government. I really don't. Hi, old, uh, uh, hi David. If, 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 if I, um, by the way, before I go on any further, if I, Sound a bit funny tonight and I get any words mixed up. It's because I had a tough the weekend at the back cracking half. And it's not painful or anything, but um, the half that's left is like a razor blade on my tongue. So it's been cutting into my tongue all weekend. So it's a bit swollen, my tongue is. And that's why I found a bit like that. So I'm very sorry. That explains that anyway. We're living in a badly written farce, says Nicky M. I am... Um, I don't think you could write a fast this bad. A fast this bad would be unbelievable. <laughs> they wouldn't get past the editor. I've um, I've got two stories for you tonight. Two stories, and I should tell you what. I'll tell you what. This one is the tiniest compared to the other one. It's 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 small potatoes compared to the main story I'm going to talk about later. So. Hi James, thanks for joining mate, thanks for joining us, yeah Wild Goose is onto it, alright let's just set everything up, because I've got a lot, a lot to get through in a short amount of time and I haven't had, I really haven't had that much time today to, repair, to prepare, are we there? Right. Hi everyone. So the the Brexit vote that was due to be um, cancelled. Oh, yeah, sorry, due to be going ahead tomorrow. I'll start that again. The Brexit vote, which was due to be uh, voted upon tomorrow, uh, the deal that Theresa May has brought back from the EU, the Parliament were going to vote from it, from it, and for all intents and purposes, it looks like they were going to vote it down and that would obviously lead to a, a, a chain of events that would not be good for Theresa May. So she has cancelled it. Or has she? <laughs> she? At least she's tried to cancel it. We'll see whether she has. Um, I'll get to that a little bit later. But first of all, covering um, politics, UK politics, the way I have done, especially over the last two or three months, for some reason... I don't know whether I'm the only one, but whenever I'm watching politics or I'm watching events unfold in the last few months in Parliament, I keep hearing this tune in my head. Honestly, it is like a scene from Benny Hill. 
at the moment. It's it's just terrible. It really is. I'm going to go to sleep tonight and have that tune in my head, and I'm going to have visions of Jacob rees Morgan and the other 70-odd members of the ERG chasing Theresa May around the House of Commons, dressed in stilettos and high heels. Now, I was going to put that music on some video of the footage of the House of Commons today, but if I did that, I would go to prison. <laughs> Honestly, I would probably go to prison. You cannot... There is a law in the UK that says you cannot use any footage from the House of Commons for comedic purposes. Very bad, apparently. Uh, John Oliver has done it in in America, and when they air last week tonight, uh, that his show last week tonight over here, when he covers that, it covers that, they cut it out whenever they air it in the UK. So all day to, uh, day to day, I've been hearing that because it really is like a scene from Benny Hill at the moment. Now, as I speak, things may have changed. <laughs> I've, I've got as up to date as I possibly could, could, so bear that in mind. Now, also bear in mind that, yeah, that Theresa May has been saying over and over for the last 10 days, two weeks, that there's no way that this Brexit vote is going to be cancelled. It's going to go ahead. It's going to go ahead. Even Dominic Raab was on um, TV this morning saying it's going to go ahead. Amber Rudd was ambushed outside her house. Did she come out of, uh, outside her house? She said it's going ahead today, and obviously then Theresa May reverses it, just like she reversed when, well, other things, so the general election springs to mind from 2017 amongst uh, uh, something else that, is, that has gone out of my head at the moment. So this is not as if she doesn't do this sort of thing on a regular basis. She does. So she's tried to cancel it. And the reason she was going to cancel it was because she was going to lose the vote, or seemingly she was going to lose the vote. And that would lead to a chain of events that would not be good for her. So she's cancelled it. And now we're at the stage where we don't know what's going to happen next. Nobody does. As for Theresa May, she has decided that this is the course of action that she's going to take. This is what she's going to try and do. Listen to what she says here. I spoke to a number of EU leaders over the weekend... And in advance of the European Council, I will go to see my counterparts in other member states and the leadership of the Council and the Commission. I will discuss with them the clear concerns that this House has expressed. We are also looking closely at new ways of empowering the House of Commons to ensure that any provision for a backstop has democratic legitimacy and to enable the House to place its own obligations on the government to enable the House to place its own obligations on the government to ensure that the backstop cannot be in place indefinitely. Mr Speaker, having spent the best part of two years poring over the detail of Brexit, listening to the public's ambitions and, yes, their fears too, and testing the limits of what the other side is prepared to accept, I'm in absolutely no doubt that this deal is the right one. It honours the result of the referendum. It Order. The remainder of the statement must be heard, and I invite the House to hear it with courtesy, and for the avoidance of doubt and also the benefit of those attending to our proceedings who are not members of the House, I emphasise that, as per usual, I will call everyone who wants to question the Prime Minister. But meanwhile, please hear her. The Prime Minister. It honours the result of the referendum. It protects jobs, security and our union, but it also represents the very best deal that is actually negotiable with the EU. I believe in it, as do many members of this House, and I still believe there is a majority to be won in this House in support of it if I can secure additional reassurance on the question of the backstop, and that is what my focus will be in the days ahead. So her focus in the days ahead is additional assurance on the backstop to say that it won't it will be temporary it won't be forever that's what she wants it's not as if she's going back to the EU and renegotiating the uh, renegotiating a deal she's not doing that she's just going back to them and saying is there any way you can just come out and say it's temporary to that I'll say well Theresa May it already is temporary it's in the document that that you negotiated. It is temporary. It says 20XX. So it's temporary for 81 years. It's not definite. Or not indefinite, rather. So that's all she's going to do. What good... What makes her think that that is going to change anybody's vote in the House of Commons? 
What makes her think her coming back from the EU and said, no, it's okay, everyone. The deal is as it is, but the EU have said it's only temporary. What makes her think that people but people in the ERG or Labour or the SN or any anybody who is against her deal is suddenly going to reverse based on that. They're not, of course. And that's not what this is all about. It's again kicking the can down the road as far as she possibly can in order to frustrate Brexit for as long as she possibly can. And this is a recurring theme for anybody who's watched my videos and channel over the last nine months. That's all they're doing. That's all they're doing is just kicking the can down the road. And she's, she keeps doing it because why? As soon as she makes a decision, she loses. She loses. She loses support either from people within her own party or from the DUP, which leads to, obviously, um, her having to resign and another government coming in or another, another uh, prime minister coming in. So it's all about conserving. I don't think it's about conserving her premiership. I think it's about her conserving, uh, her conserving, kicking it down uh, the can down the road, just to, to just make sure the Tories stop in power. Because if any Tory takes over now, there's going to be another general election. They won't be able to take over the same way that she took over from David Cameron. I'm pretty sure of that. There'll be an absolute outrage. So, as I mentioned, she might not, <laughs> she might not be able to. Um, cancel this Brexit vote because the Prime Minister can't cancel it. It has to be the government that cancels it. And there was a question as to whether they were going to cancel it at all or whether it was actually going to be forced upon her that this vote was going to go ahead tomorrow. And whether at one stage they were even talking about having a vote as to whether there was, the vote was going to go ahead tomorrow. And they were going to do that tonight. Now, as it stands, I don't know whether that's the same. Because as I say, things are changing as I speak. But that's, before I came in on air, that's the last I checked. It could still happen that there could still be a vote tonight. As to whether there'll be a vote tomorrow. As preposterous as that seems. And it does seem preposterous. Now, I want to quickly talk about this guy. Because... He comes in for a lot of criticism, does John Burko, but I've got to be honest, in the last few weeks, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, he's been bloody fantastic. Now, there's obviously been allegations made against him, and I'm, I'm not condoning anything if it's true, but he's been pretty good. And I just want to show this because you can see here that people in the, in the House of Commons and him are not happy with what's going on. Uh, Theresa May has been under a lot of pressure today. People have been screaming at her. There was one SNP woman who really laid into her, and I thought, that's great. I was gonna, I wanted to show it tonight, but I forgot to save the clip. But I just want to point this out, because he's been brilliant. He really has. Although the government's intention to halt this debate at this inordinately late stage has been widely leaked to the media in advance, I felt it only appropriate to hear what is proposed before advising the House. Holding the debate after no fewer than 164 colleagues have taken the trouble to contribute will be thought by many members of this House to be deeply discourteous. Indeed, in the hours since news of this intention emerged, Many colleagues from across the House have registered that view to me in the most forceful terms. So you can see he's not happy and he's saying there it's, um, I think he's, I'm trying to remember what his words now were now, it was deeply discourteous, um, which is the kind of language that, that's almost swearing in the House of Commons. That is deeply discourteous. Um, he's coming for a lot of criticism. And I just wanted to show that because that's the speaker there really saying and telling people what the, what the general feeling in the Houses of Parliament, of Parliament is. They feel betrayed. They feel be betrayed. And you know what? If that's how members of Parliament are feeling, you can imagine how people around the country are feeling. Um, I just want to quickly go to the man himself and his response, just to show you what he said to it. 
I could honestly show you clip after clip after clip after clip of today. I'll probably do some dissemination over the next couple of days and release videos based on the clips because she came into for some vicious attacks. This is what uh, our man JC said. The government is in disarray. Uncertainty is building for business. People are in despair at the state of these failed negotiations and concerned about what it means about their jobs, their livelihood and their communities. And the fault for that lies solely at the door of this shambolic government. The Prime Minister is trying to buy... Damn, Jeremy. Come out and say what you mean, pal. Stop beating around the bush. ...by herself one last chance to save this deal. If she doesn't take on board the fundamental changes required, then she must make way for those who can. And that has been his stance all along. Um, his stance all along is we want a general election, we want to get in power. Um, and that's pretty much everything that everything that Jeremy Corbyn does with regards to his speeches in the House of Commons, etc. Everything is just geared up for that and he's just trying to avoid any other outcome. He either wants a general election or he wants um, to be put in power and form a government himself without one. Any one of those two things is acceptable. Anything else is unacceptable. That's what he wants. And he's certainly not going to lay out exactly what he's going to do with regards to it because he's not going to give his hand away because then the Conservatives can say, oh, we'll do that, whatever it is. So, um, what happens now? <laughs> what happens now? Well, before, before we get to that, I want to show you this. The UK government's just spent nearly £100,000 on Facebook ads over a seven-day period for a Brexit deal that's been shelved. That's Mark Di Stefano noticed that. Now, some um, subscribers and some viewers have mentioned in my live stream, when I dropped videos from my live stream last week, that the live stream last week when I dropped those videos as standalone videos, people started seeing adverts before those videos for that. So if they spent £100,000 on Facebook ads, how much did they spend on YouTube ads? I didn't see them, but I had lots of people saying, oh, I got a video from the government before I watched this. How much did they spend? No doubt I will be asking for that information with, uh, um, or trying to find out that information over the next couple of days. And I just want to thank this guy. Let's remember. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Just want to quickly thank him. Just to say, you arsehole. You twat, as Danny Dyer called him. So, what happens now? Well, Nicola Sturgeon, who is uh, the head of the SNP, has told Jeremy Corbyn that if he was to table a vote of no confidence, she will support him in, support in forming a majority government if the government lose their uh, holding and lose their support on the DUP. Now, as yet, that hasn't happened. In a vote of no confidence at the moment, I think the DUP would most probably support Theresa May, even despite of all this. However, if the vote, the vote gets tabled and voted down, then that's not going to happen. So you can see now, Jeremy Corbyn is going to hold off on that vote because, until he knows that she's lost either support of enough of her own party or the support of the DUP. And he knows that when he tables that motion of no confidence, it will go through. Now, the way that could have happened tomorrow, and this is one of the reasons why, why Theresa May has cancelled it, of course, is because if the DUP voted against her deal, there is a stipulation, the rule came in only about five years ago, I think, but it, there is a stipulation that say, says if the government is voted down on any issue um, of great importance, then you can challenge, you can have a leadership challenge or you can have a challenge in the House of Commons. So... That is possible at the moment, but I don't think that's going to happen just yet. Certainly not until he knows for certain that Theresa May has lost the support of the DUP or enough people of her own party. And the latter is very important because you can't trust that. You certainly can't trust what they say. Remember, I reported a few weeks ago, Jacob Rees-Mogg saying we're going to send our letters in en masse. There's 80 members of the ERG. Only 48 are needed to trigger a vote of no confidence in the Conservative Party over Theresa May. And it didn't even reach 48. So where the F are the rest of them? 
as people were asking. So I wouldn't trust anybody in the in the in the Tory government saying, you know, I will vote, I will vote against Theresa May in a vote of no confidence, especially if that means that Labour gets in. It's going to be the DUP that he's looking at because without the support of the DUP, they haven't got a hope of winning that no confidence vote. So that I don't think will happen yet. But like I say, anything could happen and it could change as I'm speaking. Um, obviously, mentioning the ERG, they could send more letters in to the uh, 1922 committee, to the head of the 1922 committee, triggering a vote of no confidence from the Conservatives with May. And then triggering, obviously, uh, a leadership contest, which she would have to win or um, <laughs> resign. And then what would happen would be an absolute debacle, whether it leads to a general election or not. Your guess is as good as mine. I suggest if it didn't lead to a general election, um, there'd be people in the streets with yellow vests on. So what is most likely going to happen now? Everything is on the table. Let me just make that clear. Everything, general election, second referendum, extension of Article 50, no deal, May's deal, no Brexit. All of these things are on the table. As to what happens next, I can only guess. But based on what I have heard and what I have seen, what I think is going to happen is that, and I hate to say this, Theresa May is going to leave. She's going to be forced out by the end of the week. Now, this has happened before in that she was forced out and another Prime Minister came into power. I believe it happened with Winston Churchill. I was researching that uh, George Galloway mentioned something on RT and I was researching it literally before I came on air, but I couldn't find it. But that is, according to George Galloway, how Winston, it's very similar to the way Winston Churchill came to power. I'm not sure whether it was the first or the second time, actually. Um, I think that's most likely to happen. I think it's most likely that she'll be gone by the end of the week because she's not renegotiating another deal here. She's not renegotiating a better deal. She's not doing anything with regards to the deal. All she's doing is going to the EU and seemingly just ask her, asking them, can you just be nice and say it's temporary, please, so I can get this support at home and remain Prime Minister? That's what it seems to me like. This seems to me like she's just delaying, and like I say, it says cancelled there, but she, what she's actually said is deferred it. Um, she's just delayed it for a period of time. She, it could be two days, it could be two weeks, it could be up until January the 21st, I think she mentioned. But I cannot see how, I can't, how this Prime Minister can carry on governing, because she's in office, but she's not actually in power. And that's the question that Laura Kunzberg asked her. The first question Laura Kunzberg asked her in that, uh, that interview that she made um, a few weeks ago now, after it was clear that she was going to, she, she didn't have the support for her deal. She's in office, but she's not in power. And for, our, for the country, not just the Labour Party, not just the Conservatives, she's got to go. Because right now, nothing she is doing is helping this country. And all she's really out there for is for her own party and what their best interests are. I hope that clears it up for anybody who um, was a little bit confused as to what is going on. Because it's very easy to. It's... um, if, if you ask that today, so what the fuck happens now, join the club because I think everybody in the country said that same thing or something similar at some stage during today. <laughs> Neil Gardner says, the Russians are very busy spreading Novichok, bankrolling Brexiteers and momentum while they're not in, in instigating yellow vest riots in France. <laughs> I'm going to cover a little bit of that in the next story, mate. Because, like I say, this is not the biggest story. It's just not the biggest story. Not, not over the last week. Galloway is a legend, says New Left Voice. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's a great man. A great man who is smeared and slandered 
on an hour by hour, hour basis and I don't know how he's done it for the last 30, 40 years. I really don't. Uh, Five million Labour voters voted to leave the EU and he wants to stay in the customs union and the single market. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Where'd you get that information from? He wants to he wants to form a customs union. He doesn't want to stay in the customs union. He wants to form another customs union with the EU and come out of the single market. You're totally wrong there, Mandy slash Colin Freyett, Fry mate. Yeah, you're totally wrong. That's not true. This is how people get misinformed. You know? I'm sure you said that. I'm sure you didn't say that thinking, oh, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to spread some disinformation. Um, unless you work for the UK government. <laughs> we'll cover that in a bit. Um, but you've heard that information from somewhere, obviously, and it's wrong. And this is how false information spreads. Uh, Sean Calder, George Galloway always sees him off though, Gordon. Yeah, he does. Um, it's still amazing to me how he's got the, the, the fortitude to just keep going throughout all of the attacks that he has because they're vicious and they're non-stop and they come at him from angles you would never have dreamed of. I don't know how he does it. And he's still, t he's, he's still you know just sticks to what's true what would be the difference between the two customs unions well the one custom union uh, the random gamers wouldn't allow free movement of people which the EU one does um, you're not actually you're not actually in the customs union in that you're not you're not you're not, you're not with the EU um, EU's contracts from around the world. No, you're separate from the EU. You negotiate your own contracts around the world and you have a customs union with the EU of your own. So you're not in the customs union. That's what Corbyn wants, unless I am totally fucking mistaken. <laughs> Somebody's mentioned that I've got a shout on the Jimmy Dore show. Bless. Thank you. Whoever asked the question, thank you. <laughs> what's a frit? Somebody just said. The lawman said, what's the frit? Yeah, Dennis Skinner. I was going to look this up. I'm glad you reminded me. Who said the lawman? Thank you for that. I, I didn't know what it was. I thought, Maggie Thatcher said that. What does it, what does it mean? Third person present, Fritz. I'm sure she didn't use it in the urban diction dictionary for, uh, the definition. I'm sure I'm sure Margaret Thatcher didn't use Fritz in the Fritz in the same sense as the urban dictionary. Now I don't know the lawman. I'll find out. I don't know. Frightened. So somebody's uh, one love just said. There you go. Audience does it. Nah, space six four six. That's not true, mate. He's mentioned me once. Other the other times he's mentioned me, it, it's from questions. Um. Yes, Nikki. It's it. This is something that that it does annoy me because that's not the first time I've heard somebody say that. Um, and I, I know, I know Mandy and, and Mandy Fry, they're, they're quite, um, clued up on things, um, from, from the comments I've seen in the past. So them getting it wrong, this information, this misinformation is obviously coming from somewhere. Um, they're not the only ones who are getting it wrong. Dennis Skinner is getting old, says the Funkadelic fan. I tell you what, he might be getting old, but he's getting no less passionate. That's for sure.
she cancelled the vote. She's up to no good, says maybe. <laughs> or maybe, rather. Yeah, um, she's, she's deferred the vote. Whether that actually does get deferred, we'll see. I think it will, actually. I was, uh, before I came on air, Angela Ledson was talking. So there's a good chance that she's still talking now, knowing Angela Ledson. Um, or Andrea Lebson. Is it Andrea or Angela? I can't. I always get that messed up. Um, and I don't think she was talking, or they certainly weren't talking about having the vote on whether there's going to be a vote. Um, but that was on the table about an hour and a half ago. Thanks for all the uh, positive comments, everyone. I'll get to the uh, the next story in a sec. Let me just... <sighs> because this one is a bad one. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you for trying to unra unravel this shit show, she says. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, um, <laughs> it's difficult. It really isn't because there are times you, 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 you the times I've stopped myself and thought, well, I can't, it can't be that because that's fucking stupid. And then after an hour of checking myself, I thought, no, it's that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Thomas Rittenhouse, there is also a young man in Canada that mentions you now and then. He has a show, The Rational National. That's uh, the David Dole. He's great. He really is. We disagree on, I think, one thing. Yeah, we disagree on one thing. That's it. Other than that, David Dole is just spot on with pretty much everything he does. Um, I've followed him for a long time. So if you want, if you want anything... Any any sort of insight into Canadian politics? I think Keith uh, Durant, who's a regular uh, watcher of this channel, um, will tell you uh, he's great on Canadian politics and uh, from an American p perspective as well. I don't do as much videos on America anymore. I tend to try and, you know, there's too much shit at home to deal with, to be honest, without dealing with other countries' crap. And heaven knows there's a truckload of it over in America. Um yeah, he, he covers Canadian and, and American politics. He's very good. So you, you subscribe to his YouTube. We need to um, we need to subscribe to these independent channels and bypass the media if we're going to have a chance of actually a brighter future than we've got. All right. Okay. I've set this up. And I've got no notes on it whatsoever, so I'm going to be doing this on the fly. Because I didn't have time. But, no, nope, not that. <sighs> Hi, everyone. So, I have um, been talking on my channel for quite some time, about, um, for months, ever since I started about organisations that are supposedly NGOs, non-governmental organisations. They may work for the government, they may do stuff that for the government, but they're detached from the government and they're not really anything to do with the government. That is the uh, what we're led to believe. And another of these organisations has come to the fore in the last week. Now, I did a video a while ago when I dropped this video. I'll leave a link to it up there on um, the organisation's some of the other organizations that are like this, such as the Atlantic Council, such as DFR Labs, such as the National Endowment for Democracy, such as I think there was one called the um, the United something, the United Initiative of America or something like that as well. There are many of them. They are um, basically what they are is propaganda constructs. And one has been unearthed in the, na uh, in the last week on the UK side. And it was down to this just great article by the Daily Record, which everybody is citing. Secret Scottish-based office-led Infowars attack on Labour and Jeremy Corbyn. 
Okay, this is going to be big. Explosive leaked documents passed to the Sunday Mail reveal the organisation's Integrity Initiative is funded with £2 million of Foreign Office cash and run by, a military, uh, run by military intelligence specialists. Again, if I mess up any words, it's because of my tooth. I do apologise. There's not much I can really bloody do about it. A secret UK government-funded InfoWars unit based in Scotland. Nothing, so nothing to do with Alex Jones. <laughs> based in Scotland, sent out social media posts attacking Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. On the surface, the cryptically named Institute for Statecraft is a small charity operating from an old Victorian mill in Fife. But explosive leaked documents passed to the Sunday Mail revealed the organisation's integrity initiative is funded with £2 million of foreign office cash run by a military in intelligence spe specialist. The think tank is supposed, to, uh, is supposed to counter Russian online propaganda by forming clusters of friendly journalists and key influencers throughout Europe who use social media to hit back against disinformation. So this is not dissimilar to uh, DFR Labs. DFR Labs are um, a similar organisation and they, and they are subsidiary of the Atlantic Council. The Atlantic Council who is funded by the UK government, Foreign Office, the US government, US Army, um, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, NATO, you know, all the, the, any, all the bad people you can think of in the world. Um, uh, they're all funding Atlantic Council, they fund DFR Labs. Now, DFR Labs were meant to identify Russian bots online. They outed uh, Citizen Halo as a bot. They outed Ian56 as a bot. And they outed Partisan Girl as a bot. All three are obviously people. <laughs> One of them was actually verified on Twitter. So she was a verified real person. And they got that totally wrong. Now, it was all... Obviously, every account that was critical of the Western government, that's all it was. Everybody gets lumped in and just everybody gets lumped in with the, oh, it's a Russian bot. It's not a Russian bot. It's just a person who's pissed off at the US government and the UK government for doing all this horrible shit around the world. And you know what? I'm fucking one of them. I'm no different. But our investigation has found worrying evidence. Uh-oh. That the shadowy pro program's official Twitter account has been used to attack Corbyn, the Labour Party, and their officials. One tweet co quotes a newspaper article calling Corbyn a useful idiot. I'll come on to that in a bit. A message from the UK government funded organisation promotes an article that states, unlike Galloway, talking about George Galloway, Corbyn does not scream conspiracy, he implies it. While another added, it's time for the Corbyn left to confront a Putin problem. I'll get to those in a bit. Um, it, is not, it says here that it is not just the Labour leader who has been re on the receiving end of online attacks. His strategy and communications director, Seamus Milne, was also targeted. The Integrity Initiative, who's based at Gateside Mill near Akhtamukti, Akhtamukti, retweeted a newspaper report that said Milne is not a spy that would be beneath him. But what he has done, wittingly or unwittingly, is work with a Kremlin agenda. So you can see this is obviously, you know, attacking Corbyn or attacking anybody to do with Labour and painting them as some sort of Russian agent or Russian um, Kremlin puppet. The article continues. Another retweet pro promoted a journalist who said just as he supports the Russian bombardment of Syria, Seamus Milne supported the Russian slaughter of Afghanistan, which resulted in more than a million deaths. The, in the Integrity Initiative has been accused of supporting Ukrainian politicians who oppose Putin, even when they also have suspected far-right links. This is something that's similar with the other um, organisations that I mentioned, the Atlantic Council, yada, yada. Oh, that one hurt. Further leaked documents appear to show a Twitter campaign that resulted in a Spanish politician believed to be friendly to the Kremlin being denied a job. I've looked into that. It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, he was a socialist in Spain. And they basically, this cluster in Spain, uh, got together and spread a load of information about him that he was some sort of, um, he was friendly to the Kremlin, friendly to Putin. And yeah, he didn't get it. So it works what these people are doing. The papers detail how the Integrity Initiative alerted key influences around Europe who launched an online campaign against the politician. In the wake of leaks, it's all, uh, which also detail government grant applications, the Foreign Office have been forced to confirm they provided massive funding to the Integrity Initiative. So they had 300,000 uh, the year before last and nearly 2 million so far. Oh, sorry, uh, last financial year they had three, almost 300,000 and almost 2 million pounds this year. 
almost two million pounds. So it's two point three almost million pounds. I wonder how many um, how many homeless people could that have housed? How many um, you know how many how many teachers or nurses could that have trained? I always wonder that thing whenever I see governmental waste. And with this Tory government, I see it a lot. Politicians and academics have reacted with fury to, a news, uh, to, to news. A covert government-funded unit has been attacking the official opposition in Parliament. So it's got there some reactions from, from Labour, some reactions from um, other, other people. David Miller, a professor of political sociology in the School for Policy Studies at the University of Bristol, added, it's extraordinary that the Foreign Office would be funding a Scottish charity to counter Russian propaganda, which ends up attacking Her Majesty's opposition and soft-peddling far-right politicians in Ukraine. Okay, what I will say to David Miller, who is professor of political sociology, um, you are correct that they are doing that, but it's not extraordinary. The more I look at it, it's standard practice for them i'm afraid you're wrong there article t continues the senior manager of the uh, manager of the integrity initiative appears to be chris donnelly a website bi biography states he's a graduate of manchester university and reserve officer in the in the british army who previously headed the british army soviet studies documents passed the sunday mail suggested he was appointed an honorary colonel uh, the year Integrity Initiative was formed. Papers we have viewed also suggest senior operative Dan Lafayidni was an SAS soldier. After contacting the Integrity Initiative through its website to ask about the Labour attacks, we received a call from spokesman Stephen Dalziel. Come to him in a bit as well. He said, I'm not aware of that. I'm, the one, I'm not the one who controls the Twitter account. If it was criticism of one of our politicians, then that shouldn't be on, her, on there. Hmm. When asked about the military background of the Integrity Initiative in police, Dalziel denied any Secret Service involvement. <laughs> denied every... Just denied any Secret Service involvement. Remember that when I come to the Chris Williams tweet in a bit. He added, Chris Donnelly was in the TA for many years. Dan Lafayette, who was a Scot, that's why it, why it is registered in Scotland, was many years ago in the army. army. Uh, previous online biographies about Dalziel said suggest he spent a year in the British Army in 1981. Leaked documents show a funding application to the Foreign Office that details the unit's work. So this is an organisation, by the look of it, that is full of ex-spooks and ex-army people. Further papers reveal a unit in Lithuania which received overseas funding to support a new hub cluster creation and to educate cluster leaders and key people in Vilnius in Infowar techniques. This is a strategy that um, is employed by Bellingcat. This is another one of those organisations that is funded by the government and is meant to be an NGO but it's not. It's not, a, it's not an NGO at all. If anything, Bellingcat or anti-truth, if you ask me. The Foreign Office did not respond to a request for comment. Now, I wanted to read the whole article. And there's a reason I wanted to read it, because this is bigger than the Brexit fiasco. It really is. This is huge. This is just a sample of some of the tweets that they sent out. Now, I'm just going to have to switch over to... Uh, the other one here. This is just a sample of the tweets that they sent out there. You can see there the the, the second one at the bottom. It says uh, Mike Chernovich doesn't always post any anti anti vaxxer crap, but when he does, it's after retweeting the pseudo left and totally legit a sad a, apologist war Nazi guy. Mike Chernovich. <laughs> Mike Chernovich. Oh, I've messed up here. Just bear me a second. See? Sorry about that. I messed up. So this is a, a, some more examples of the tweets. Um, 
Anders Asland there which, uh, so they've retweeted Anders Asland who's saying any basically anything anti-Russian they, re- they retweet and then you can see there they've retweeted somebody who was attacking the journalist Rania Kalek Rania Kalek put it this way the people at the Guardian who work at the Guardian aren't fit to lick Rania Kalek's boots she's an amazing journalist and they're attacking her why? Because she tells the truth. And this is a running theme that you're going to see. You've already seen that they attacked George Galloway. Um, you can see there they're retweeting anything that Michael McFall says. Michael McFall is somebody I have... <laughs> I laugh at on this channel all the time. I laugh at. The guy's pathetic. He's pathetic. And they're retweeting him as if he's wonderful. Um, retweeting anybody pro-Ukraine, anti-Russia, obviously. And as you can see here, excuse me, um, just as he supports the Russian bombardment of Syria, Seamus Milne supported the Russian slaughter of Afghanistan, which resulted in over a million deaths. So this is spreading disinformation, is what it is. That's exactly what they're there. They're not there to dispel disinformation. They're, They're there to actually spread it. That's what the aim of this group is. And you can see there, they've actually tweeted there. They've made a tweet. That's not a retweet, that's a tweet. Mr. Corbyn was a useful idiot in the phrase acrophily, uh, acrophily, I can never pronounce it because of my tooth, attributed to Lenin. His open, visceral anti-Westernism helped the Kremlin cause as surely if he had been secretly peddling Western, Westminster tittle-tattle for money. That, remember, comes from a organization that is supposed to that is funded by the government are supposed to be neutral and that's what they're saying shouldn't shouldn't be the case and here's another couple of the um of the tweets that i found just let's switch back to the same same one um and you can see here at the bottom there, unlike Galloway, Cor- Galloway Corbyn does not scream so a conspiracy. He implies it. That's a tweet that's obviously been cancelled or they've been blocked. Um, this is a another, obviously, um, it's an obvious propaganda construct, is what it is. And just to ram my point home, <laughs> that it's an obvious propaganda construct... Here's Carol Codswallop. That's not my words. That's the words of Andrew Neil. Carol Codswalder of um, The Guardian. The arse gravy of a newspaper that is The Guardian. Um, she did a thread on this to, obviously, um, this is The Guardian. So, oh, somebody's attacked somebody in the government. This spy, you know, this, uh, this, somebody's attacked an organisation that's full of ex-spies and ex-military. Can pretty much sure, uh, much be assured that the Guardian are going to come out on the side of them, because that's basically what the Guardian is now. The Guardian is just an extension of GCHQ, in my opinion. That's it. A few journalists aside, it's just an extension of GCHQ. And I want to talk about this tweet that she sent out because you know, you just know. Tell us in the chat who she's going to blame. <laughs> It's coming. Are you ready? A short thread. That is going to unleash the dogs of war. Hi. Here I am. Dog of war. Ready for action. But anyway, these are the tweets that led to today's daily record. And she obviously puts out a selection of the tweets. She says the daily record reported that in uh, the Integrity Initiative uh, set up to counter Russian disinformation was using FCO funds to attack Labour. That story rightly drew an immediate response from Emily Thornbury and John McDonnell calling for an immediate inquiry. So, she's doing the background here. She's right so far. The source of that daily record story appears to be documents that were... Um, that, in, <laughs> that were hacked by the Russian state. The source of the daily record story appears to be the documents the Integrity Initiative reported were hacked by the Russian state i.e. the same methodology used in the US prior to the presidential election. She got no proof of that. No proof whatsoever. She's got absolutely no proof, even now, two years later, over two years later, that what was released via WikiLeaks was hacked at all. 
She's got no proof of any of it. Yet, hey, I'm a journalist for The Guardian. Gotta stick, for, stick up for my GCHQ, folks. Tell it, ho, chaps. Collection, hacked documents. Oh, she's made a correction. Oh, sorry, hacked documents. Yes, she's made a point of saying, no, these documents were hacked. Amplified by the Russian state. <laughs> so the story boils down to four ill-advised retweets of opinion pieces that suggest Labour is inadvertently assisting Russian government. So let's examine that, shall we? Now we are finally... At, now, now she goes on there to give you some examples there where they've retweeted and said stuff that's actually um, not pro, uh, th that's actually uh, anti-conservative as well. Nowhere near the uh, level of intensity that was aimed at obviously Jeremy Corbyn and Labour with those tweets, but obviously she's making a comparison, and obviously I've just given you a, a small selection. There are hundreds of them. You know? But she she goes on in this, and I'm not going to show you it all. You can see where this is going to. I'm not going to spend too much time on the Guardian in future, to be honest. And in fact, if ever I do use the Guardian as, as a source in future, I am going to blank out the rest of the Guardian's name and just put GCHQ in their letter heading, just so everybody knows exactly who is writing that piece of shit that I'm talking about. So I'm not going to spend any more time on that. Steve Howell says this. Now, Steve Howell, I believe, ran... Um, he, he was something to do with Jeremy Corbyn's campaign in 2017. He's his campaign manager or something like that. And he said, as funding for these black ops started two years ago, uh, Electoral uh, Communications UK should investigate to see if public money was used in breach of electoral rules. A rerun of the 27 general election may be necessary. I'm sure Carol Codwala, People's Vote, will, be, uh, will back me. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring that up because he was he was quoting there on on um, him saying it was no conspiracy theory theory. First of all, if you had said or you'd suggested this a week ago, if you had suggested that they were doing this a week ago without the truth, you would be smeared as a conspiracy theorist and a lunatic for a start. And second of all, Integrity Initiative was started in 2015. What happened in 2015? Remind me. In Scotland, where Integrity Initiative... Why is Integrity Initiative set up in Scotland? What happened in 2015? People are going to be digging and finding stuff, I'm sure, on the independence vote in Scotland. George Galloway obviously said something about it. He said, here is the news. Mainstream media has fought a three-year battle to convince Britain Corbyn was a terrorist, a Russian spy, or both. They did so with a full cooperation, if not at the instigation, of the deep state. It is now revealed that some of them work for, or with, the deep state. News over. And I really wanted to point that out, because that's that's how big this is. However big the... the, the, the and I'm sure that the media are not making a big deal about this. I know the BBC have finally um, uh, reported it today and other outlets have. But they're not going to make this a big deal. They're going to tone it down as much as possible. Imagine if it was the other way and it was a Russian thing. Can you imagine if we found out that Russia was actually doing this? Can you imagine if we, if we found out that Russian foreign office money had gone to that place in Fife? And they were spreading this stuff about Corbyn and Labour. Can you imagine what would happen? Just saying. <laughs> and Chris Williamson, as before I came on air, actually said this. Uh, uh, no, actually, I think this was yesterday. He said, I asked Alan Duncan to disclose the nature and purpose of his department's funding of the Integrity Initiative. He refused, citing national security. This simply isn't good enough. There can be no excuse for shoddy political spin using on undermining our democracy. First of all, if this organisation is doing nothing terrible and it's all above board, why cite national security? And if it's... Uh, why cite national security? And also, didn't they, the government just last week... Um, cite national security as the reason that the uh, the legal advice for the Brexit draft agreement shouldn't be published in full. They said no, no, no. It's national agree. Uh, it's it's national security is the reason why. It turns out it's just the stuff in there that made the government look absolutely fucking terrible. That's the truth. That's what national security to me is code for. So whenever somebody says national security, like especially Alan Duncan, the arsehole that is, 
I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to be looking into that, and you can bet my ass I'm going to be doing that over the next few, over the coming days. Now, obviously, I've alluded to this because this is Max Blumenthal's blog, um, who uh, or his web, the website he writes for, one of them, and he, this is, you know, a few months ago. This is back in October, and he was talking about how this was when the Facebook were coming down on and banning accounts left, right, and centre. And they've said here, this is the Facebook censorship of alternative media, just the beginning, says top neocon insider. And anybody who's watched my channel for any period of time knows I've been talking about this all for a long time. I've been saying this is building up and building. Something is going on. They're doing something. And we get, I'm not the only one. <laughs> I'm not the only independent analyst, if you like, that is starting to look and think, what the... F is going on. You'll be no doubt unsurprised to hear that one of the things I found out about the Integrity Initiative is um, a contributor for them is Ben Nimmo. Ben Nimmo works for DFR Labs, who is the Atlantic Council. So there's a connection there, and I'm absolutely positive that the more people dig and the more I dig I'm going to be finding more connections between these shady non-governmental organizations Craig Murray brilliantly said this can Dan Cazetta who I mentioned earlier the source of the expert art articles and interviews on why the Novichok was so selectively lethal was paid by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office via the integrity initiative that connects scribbles this is huge every journalist in the country should be on this every journalist in the country should be on this and digging up shit not trying to defend it like Carol Codswallop We're paid by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office via the Integrity Initiative. He now denies he ever worked for US Intelligence when his byline for those very articles gave us that as his credentials. So, you can see here, this is something that is not just huge. and glo It's not just huge, but it's not an isolated incident. This is just another in a long line of organisations that have sprung up over the last five or six years and that are spreading governmental disinformation, Western governmental disinformation online and silencing any voices like mine who speak out against it. I'll give you one guess. Bearing all that in mind and evaluating all that information, I'll give you one guess as to whether this video will be monetized or not. They are coming after us and they are doing it with organisations like the Atlantic Council and the Integrity Initiative. And we have to speak up against it. We have to. We absolutely cannot let them do this. This is Orwellian, is what it is. It's Orwellian. We are, you know, 1984 was not an instruction manual. It was a dystopian novel. And we need to stop these sorts of uh, organisations spreading, you know, this disinformation around and pointing fingers at people like Ian 56 and, and, and Syrian Girl and um, Citizen Halo, that grandmother in Finland, who would just care. That's all they do. They just care. They can see the evil in the world and they want to speak out in, in one voice and try and stop it. And these organisations are trying to stop that happening. What sort of organisation does that? The Ministry for Truth. That's the sort of organisation that does that. This is why we have to support independent media. I know I go on about it a lot, but we have to. Because you won't get this fucking information from the BBC. You just won't. And you're certainly not going to get it from The Guardian. Right, I'm back, guys. I can come and talk to you. Let's um, oops. Hey everyone, Five Eyes love you, Gordon. Says Keith Javant. Yeah, they probably do. I'm, I'm, 
I, I think if I found out I was on some sort of list, <laughs> I'd probably be um, I'd probably be a bit a, a bit, oh, <laughs> probably a bit proud. Oh, <laughs> I must be doing something right. Leo Brusselman says it's even past Orwellian. Yeah. Deep thought. I have seen an awful lot of McCarthyism resur resurfacing, Gordon. Great point. Because this is what it is. It's McCarthyism 2.0. You know, when, when, when Trump screams... Trump screamed something on Twitter the other day, as he does in capitals, and I don't really pay much attention to what, what, what Trump does. I mean, I sometimes clip them up just because they're funny, and I, and I think, oh, well, I'll show that in a live stream. Um, for instance, this... <laughs> I gotta, show, I gotta show this. I'm thinking about it. Somebody's mentioned Trump's tweets, haven't they? So Donald Trump came out. I think it was yesterday, or it might have been today. Um, yeah, he came out and said it's today. So this was uh, this one. No, it's not that. Sorry, I'll get it right in a minute. Here we go. So he said this. On the 3rd of December, so this is a week ago, I am certain that at some time in the, fu in the future, President Xi and I, together with President Putin of Russia, will start talking about a meaningful halt to what has become a major and uncontrollable arms race. The US spent $760 billion this year, crazy. So here, there's, there's Trump a week ago saying, we're spending too much money on the military. And then today, he says, by the way, can we up that defence budget from 716 to 750 like it was previously? So he's complained about it and then added another $34 billion to it. So I don't really pay much attention to Trump's tweets, but when he, does tr when he does tweet out that this is a witch hunt against him with this Russia conspiracy, when he does tweet out that, and when he, when he does, you know, attack the media in the way he does, it lands. That doesn't hurt him. It lands. That's good for him. Because people like me who don't like him go, yeah, I agree with you. And the media and, and the corporate, you know, establishments are, uh, you know, you've got people like, um, the point I was going to try to make was, because, you know, Ricky Gervais was retweeting him on Twitter and, and, and talking, you know, deriding it as if it's crap. And it's like, this guy is talking, that, when he just say that stuff, Ricky, that's when he's talking the fucking truth. Yet he leaves all his other, other tweets al alone. It's really weird. So, yeah, it is, it's McCarthyism. You are right, Deep Thought. Syrian girl is fab size, good dog. Yes, she is. She's bloody great. I will try and get her on the show one day. Although I'm not one for getting guests on. I think I've only I think I've only ever had one guest on. Oh yeah, somebody um somebody sent me some super chats, didn't they? Let's get to them, so I um, don't want to miss them. Uh, so, Mertzaya Marsa donated, thank you very much. Um, Aston Villa less fucked up than Parliament, he says. Ackington Stanley are less, than, less fucked up than parla uh, Parliament, uh, Mertz Armour. Thanks for your donation, mate. Uh, Rebecca Miller says, Hope Independent Press outlives Article 13. Yes, me too. Um, the wording in that needs to change. That's all it is. Uh, there's Article 11 as well. That's a big one. The, the two of them. I've looked at Article 13 and it's going to go through, I think, they're going to have another vote on it in January, if I remember. Um, but there is, the, the wording is going to change, so we've got to see what they put forward. They're obviously in talks with the media giants like Google, etc. Um, and I'm sure that they'll come to some arrangement. Because as it stands, as it stands, I mean, I would have to, I would have to at least, at the very least, tack down all of the thumbnails or 90% of the thumbnails of my videos for sure. And I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, 90% of my videos were taken down as a result of it. 
I don't think it will go through in its current form, but we'll see. But it's another reason to get out of the fucking EU, as far as I'm concerned, because this is the sort of shit they do. They try and pass these ridiculous laws to help out organisations. Remember, this is all this is, all that is, is for more money to go to corporations. That's all it is. It's so corporations get more money. They get their link. They, they, they get their link tax, and they get um, you know money, more money from creators like me, giving them stuff, uh, money for using their images and blah 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 blah. Even if it's just a screenshot, you know. But it, the wording makes it impossible, impossible for Google to let anybody upload videos to their site. <laughs> it's just yeah, because there's no way that they could differentiate. So we'll see. But it's another one of these laws that. You don't know whether they're doing it, wording it that way on purpose to, to get independent media. You just don't. And I know that sounds a bit um, conspiracy theorist, but, you know, uh, Patrick, um, I can never remember his second name. I've got to get his name right because he talks some damn fine sense. He really does. Just bear me a second. Patrick Henningsen was, um, I think he was on UK Column earlier. I didn't see the segment, but he tweeted it out. And um, he said it's desperate, you know. The, the, the media are, are doing some crazy things at the moment. Crazy. Thank you, Jagpreet. That's very kind of you, mate. Thank you. Um, they're doing some crazy things, and you've got to ask why. And there have been times this year when I thought, I've honestly thought, I'm going fucking crazy here. I'm going crazy because either <laughs> either the, the media has been co-opted by Western governments around the world and journalism is dead and the fourth estate is dead. Either that has happened or I'm going fucking crazy. Thankfully, my sanity is intact. But unfortunately, it does mean that there are certain publications that you just cannot trust anymore. You certainly cannot trust anything that's printed in The Guardian. Anything. And that's sad. It's just sad. Oh, did I? I'm not going to go. I'm not going to shed a tear for one there. You sound like a communist, Gordon, says Lion Cash. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> the left and the right did come together, says B Green. It's called the DNC. Oh, he didn't. Oh, boom. <laughs> the left and the right did come today. It did come together. It's called the Democratic National Committee. That's brilliant, B Green. I'm still in that. Patrick is brilliant. Yes, he is, Nicky. Um, I've been aware of him long, probably only about... Since I started the channel, I think. Oh, God, my tooth hurting. If you're going to tell a lie, Gordon, make it a big one. And then tell it as often as possible. Yeah, correct, Deep Thought. Uh, Sean Calder says, off on a tangent, Gordon, but do you think the FA will bring back the four foreigners rule after Brexit? <laughs> really, I don't. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I don't care. I don't give a shit about football. They're all talking about racism in football today and whether Sterling, Ryan, uh, uh, Raheem Sterling has been facing undue criticism and you've got people like Piers Morgan getting in on the axe and talking all about... You know, they, 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 it's just yes, there's racism in football. You know, but what's what? I mean, honestly, to me, what's worse? What's worse than Raheem Sterling getting criticism from the press, which I do think has happened? What's worse is Raheem Sterling getting criticism 
undue criticism from the press for his performances, possibly because he's black. And then you've got people like Phil Foden, who's played, I don't know, five games for Manchester City. Five games, maybe. Buying his mum a £2 million mansion at the age of 18. When, when you've got 18-year-olds with that amount of money, they're not going to grow up and go, and go into their 20s. You know, it's going to be very difficult for them to keep their feet on the ground. Very difficult. They, you, you, you need to have a, a brilliant manager, man manager, to be able to um, um, bring those, those people who are, who are coming through, um, you know, into adulthood with millions of pounds to keep their feet on the ground. Alex Ferguson did it, but not many others can. And now with the amount of money in football, it's just got ridiculous. So what's what's worse for me, more than the media criticism of Raheem Sterling, which is bad, is the amount that these players, who are big part players, are getting paid when they're... I mean, how many minutes did Phil Foden play last season? I'm assuming it wasn't a lot. That's my rant over with. I don't like football anymore, as you can probably tell. Gordon, are you a Jimmy Dore fan? <laughs> Lone Star Progressive says, I am... Um, yeah, one of the biggest. He's great. A Skripal update say is Shane Burkhart. There isn't. You can't talk about the Skripals. Where's the Skripals? There you go. There's my update. Where's the Skripals? It's interesting that the Integrity Initiative were um, paying people who were invo- involved in that um, in the media fall out of the script holes. It's really interesting, that is. Jimmy bought, bought me here, says Tele, uh, Tele Series. That, no, great. If I, yeah, but put it this way, if you came here from Jimmy, Jimmy Dore, I'm not trying to be funny or anything. I'm not a comedian, but I think you'll like the angle that I have on things. It's very similar. No worries, Trisha. You take care. Yeah, Big, big Daz, that's a good point. Big Daz 72 says, I remember John Barnes running out for England and the entire stadium making monkey noises. Me too. It's nothing today compared to with 20 years back. It isn't. It's, it's nothing compared to, you know, the, the shit that John Barnes and Viv Anderson especially went through uh, was was horrific. Um but that's not, I mean, I'm not diminishing the, the, the stuff that, I mean, there was somebody had a banana thrown up the other day. It's like, come on, it's 2018 for Christ's sake, you know. And it's a, you've always got to remember as well, nobody, nobody, not a single person is born racist. Nobody. So it's society that's, that's at fault here, not necessarily the individual. Patrick, thank you very much, sir. That's very nice of you. Neil Gardner, how do you explain Alan Bastani's support uh, David Miliband as a Labour leader in 2015? Uh, Miliband supported Blair's Wars and now heads of refugees, NGO Suspicious. Um, I haven't looked at it, Neil. I heard something about it the other day, but I, I, it's something that was over the weekend. Um, I'll look into it more. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I know what you're talking about. I do know what you're talking about because I saw it. I'll um, I'll check into it. Thanks for reminding me, actually. Yeah, uh, David. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether it was David or Ed who um, actually sold the planes to Saudi Arabia, the typhoons. I think it was David Miliband who did that, didn't it? He was the one who sorted the contract out with the Saudi Arabians to sell them the planes that they are now dropping on the heads of poor bloody Yemeni children. Uh... 
Uh, John Smith, yeah. Jamal mentions Gordon too. I mention Jamal all the time. He's my buddy, Jamal is. Me and Jamal are friends. I, 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 I wish he could have made it over here. I really, really could. I would love to sit down with that guy and have a long chat with him over a few games of chess. I really would. He's a great guy. It's just a shame. Fucking couldn't get the treatment that he needed over here, could he? In 2010, you mentioned uh, in uh, Neil. I know what you're talking about, mate. I do. I do know what you're talking about because I I saw the I forget where I saw the the where did I see the information from? Somebody was talking about it the other day. It was over the weekend. I'll look into it. Uh, Rebecca Miller's brought up a really good point here, guys, and I want to um I want to point this out. Really good point. This is Rebecca. The Brexit vote, sh- a vote showed that people living in an area with higher immigration overwhelmingly voted to remain now some people i've heard say oh well that's because there's more immigrants there more immigrants well it's the integration when you actually integrate with people from other religions from other creeds from other color you realize they're no different to you and the fear goes away it's the people who haven't been exposed to the immigration that are scared of it they're the ones who voted to leave more. That's a really good point, that is, um, Rebecca. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and obviously, also, if you combine that with um, low education levels and you combine that with low um, income levels, then there are all sorts of stats you can spin from it. But that was a really, really important one. Thank you, B Green. A point for you and a cookie for the pub. I will, you know, I promise you, B Green, um, I will. Buy the dog a bone with that. Won't, it won't be a uh, it won't be a cookie. It'll be a bot. Uh, it'll be a big bone. I buy these big bones about like that big, <laughs> and they last to about four hours. They're meant to last a, a month, but they should go through them in four hours. Thank you for that point, Rebecca. That was a really good point. Ah, oh. sorry, that tooth really just cut into my uh, tongue. Oh. oh, sorry, I think I just passed out a little bit. <laughs> that really hurt. Ow. Yeah, there's going to be, um, I'm going to be talking about the um, the yellow vests probably tomorrow. Right, I'm going to end this scream, everybody, because it's only Monday and... As a bit of a bonus for you this week, and because I didn't, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. First of all, web, my website is up. It's not finished yet. I've got to do something with the API key, um, but the website is up at gordondimmock.com. Um, that's why there wasn't many videos from me at the tail end of last week because I was sorting out that and I was doing some research for something else as well. Um, which is why I did this live stream really tonight rather than rather than release videos today. Obviously, with everything breaking this morning, I thought, well, I'll just go live tonight and rather than do two or three videos and then release those as videos and do another live stream tomorrow on the schedule because I, I do one every Tuesday. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock and I'll release these uh, two videos tomorrow. My tooth is really hurting there, so I'm going to have to go, guys, because, uh, yeah, I need to get this pulled, I think. Awesome. Um, ah, excuse me. Just bear me a second. I just want to make sure that I've um, I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Yeah. It's not the tooth itself. It's just it, it. It's really sharp and it's cutting into my tongue because it uh, it broke. Right. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, I'll release these tomorrow. Uh, release these two video, two, two videos tomorrow, um, and I'll also do a live stream tomorrow night at nine with some, with more stories. And until then, uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to go off and buy one of these because I get a feeling that I'm, we're all going to need these in 2019 in the UK. At least I say, at least I, <laughs> I at least I hope so. <laughs> Thanks everyone, uh, very much everyone. Peace. Take care. Love you all. Thanks for supporting me.
What's the matter with you? Come here. What's the matter? Silly dog. <laughs>